Welcome to the magic of human beings. I'm Carol Cristina da Silva. I'm a puppeteer, theatre maker, actress, voiceover artist, and my life purpose is to bring joy, creativity, and love into the world. And that's why I created the magic of human being. And today, we have Kate Cherney. She's an author, playwright, wordsmith, and she's a great friend and an inspiring human being. So you are in, you are in for a fantastic talk. Let's bring Kata. Hello, how are you? Hello, Kata. Hello, how Carol. Are you? Morning. I'm good. How are you? Good. Could you just turn a little bit of your volume for me, please? Sure, sure. One second. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be like, what? What did you say? Huh? <laughs> okay. So, I want to start by asking about your background. Well, I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in Manhattan and I came to London in my 20s for, as I like to say, my starter husband. And then I <laughs> second husband and I've lived here now for over 30 years and I have two children and I'm a writer I've written some short plays I've acted I've worked in the art world so I kind of I've worked in film so I kind of kicked around the creative industries oh lovely and how did you start writing I was working in film and I was reading a lot of film treatments that I didn't think were very interesting and so I wrote Happy as Larry initially as an eight page film treatment. And it took me about four months to kind of figure out the bones of the story. And I gave it to a film company who had expressed interest in the idea. And they're like, well, we're not going to do this because we're doing another cult story, but this really feels like a book. You should just go back and make it into a book. And then I showed it to a couple other people and they all said the same thing. So I just thought, great, I'll just make the treatment fatter. And then I realized. <laughs> Uh, no, it doesn't work like that. So I had to kind of throw out the treatment and treat, you know, and I started to learn how to write by doing it. And I think the first 10 drafts were pretty crappy, but I just kept on working at it and going back and going back and getting feedback from people. I worked with two editors. The last one I worked with was fantastic, but it was a very long process I weaved it in with raising two kids and having a job and a husband and a social life and a family life and all that stuff. So it took me, it took me 10 years, I would say, to write the book, to really get you, to start to finish. <laughs> yes. And I remember reading the script. Yes. It was a script and uh, there was moments on it, like that were incredible like the motion, oh, the story was, was there. So to put it into a book. So it's interesting starting as a film and then making to a book. Yes, and I think it works. I mean, I definitely don't think it could be a movie. Um, it has been optioned for TV and I think TV, if it comes to fruition, is a much better platform for it because it's a story that needs to be told in three or four segments. I don't think you can do it in 90 minutes without galloping through important transitions and, you know, the texture of the family life. So I'm hoping that if it is, you know, if the option is exercise, that that is how it will end up. So you're hoping. And yeah. uh, yes, you already mentioned it because I have many friends going through these, like being a mom, having kids, having to look after house, food and, and working and then writing a book 
were do you find time for it <laughs> um i made some choices to work part time instead of full time and i think to a certain degree i had a not very nice experience with the last two film companies i worked for and then i just realized in a sense i've aged out of this cuz no one wants to hire anyone with children because they're always afraid that you won't be able to stay till 9:00 at night which is true and i realized i have to decide now that my focus is not going to be my career in film but my focus is going to be writing and it was a very considered and at times painful decision because i loved the work that i did in film but also there was this constant battle between my home life my kids work you know not having enough hours in the day only putting them to bed only seeing them you know very you know very infrequently throughout the the week and i just felt like you know what i i'm lucky to have had that time in film but it's not for me any longer i can see that ana paula commented so true and so did riza yep yeah yeah Mom I mean, and... I remember getting called back for a job in film and this woman said to me, "You have children. What's going to happen? How will they make tea if you have to stay at work late?" And I'm thinking, "Make tea? Like what does this have to do with the job that I'm being interviewed for?" And at that point I just knew I don't have the job. So Oh, wow. Being on toast was the deal breaker there, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh is a story that needed to be told huh? oh absolutely i mean i i always say that i sort of started I, i sort of used my life story when i was a teenager i felt sorry for myself a lot more so i think i used it as a way of arousing pity in people and then as i you know got older i started using it as a, in an ironic way like oh you think you have a bad family well my family you know it became like a dinner party repartee telling stories about my crazy family background and then i kind of realized no there's pathos and there's humor and somehow i have to bring these strands together and really tell the story for what it was so i think i tried to achieve that when i wrote it and i have a quote here from uh, my angelo that he says there is no greater agony than bury an untold story inside you I agree 100%. 100%. And uh, do you think how difficult was it because it's based on your experience uh and family so how difficult was it to write while like your mom and your your sisters and brothers how were they supportive how was that like It was difficult because when I started writing it my son was um like you know like 6 or 7 so he was close to the age that I was when I lost my father and my mother never really talked about the past in a critical way she talked about it through the filter of her own experience so in her mind this is something that happened to her but that she had no accountability with and my brother was helpful to a point but it was my sister who I would just sort of say but what happened I don't remember because I was quite young and she would say well this is what happened and I would be like really huh <laughs> and then just try to kind of imagine around it or take aspects grains of what I remembered and then bring them together so but you know some of it is your imagining it isn't a literal life story it's about the themes of my life and how they played out yeah. but you know, um my mo- you know the mother the bad boyfriend I just realized I had such a hard time writing about him even though I lived with him for 7 years with my mother but equally I felt there was so much about him I just blocked out. So ah mm-hmm. oh, and just so I just reread it and again ah oh. oh, there is so many scenes that brought tears to my eyes and so could you read us the author's note please so we can talk more about the happy as larry Okay. Thank you. Let me find it. Tada. Okay. <laughs> Tell me if I'm reading too fast cuz I do that sometimes. Okay. There was, there was and yet there was not. That was the opening to a Georgian folktale my mom used to read to me. And in many ways, this contradictory notion holds true for my book. 
There was an almighty chaos which set in after my father died. In no particular order, my family's finances seesawed, routines went out the window, and my older siblings joined the Sullivanians, a cult that thrived on New York's Upper West Side until it disbanded in the late 80s. Our mom sought to reclaim her happiness with someone who made us children unhappy, and in my own blunderbuss fashion, I found my moxie with my friends who are still my go-to people to this day. Memory is an unreliable narrator. I wanted the freedom to condense time and not be beholden to biographic particulars. So I reimagined these events, firstly by making my fictionalized self eight years older than I was in real life when we were bereaved. I have written truthfully about my experience without necessarily being truthful to the facts. I have taken liberties with events I was not privy to or which I heard about secondhand. By writing in the third person, I allowed Saskia to become a character who is me and not me. This in turn gave me the vehicle to be private and public. The only time I wrote in the first person is the following excerpt, which was my very first stab at tackling the story. Most importantly, I wanted to portray the exquisite peculiarities of growing up in a New York that no longer exists and pay homage to a city that will forever make my heart skip a beat. As in any good folktale, we eventually had a happy enough ending. We pulled through it, and then some, with an abundance of love, red wine, and dark humor. Some people have a bad hair day, but I had a bad hair decade. Looking back, and I guess you could say that was the least of my problems. You see, my problems were of the chemical type, the fun up till dawn, downtown party girl sort, and the sort where Cessia meets water and the world as you know it blows up in your face. I've since traded in living on that little island off the east coast of America for another soggier one off the northwest coast of Europe. Mostly I have good hair days now, thanks to brand name products and the, and the knowledge I've gained over the years. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This isn't a story about hair care and island hopping. It's about the time when we stopped being we after daddy died. I think of my father when I smell turpentine and cigarettes, baseballs and highballs, Rothko reds and the blue nuts of jazz. NYC is my DNA. Blondie and the great blackout are in my bloodline. Broadway is a river in me and my family are the rocks, worn smooth, which no matter how far I travel will always remain at the center of my being. That's the first time I've read that since my brother died. So it's gotten me, oh, a, little, Keita. Gotten me a little agitated. Yep. Yeah. So. Huh. Okay. <laughs> and uh, since your brother died, you just wrote an article about it as well. Yes, on Medium. On oh, Media. Yeah. yeah. I read it yesterday and it's like, I lost a, like a friend, dear friend last year and my uncle, cancer, cancer as well. And uh, yeah, reading what you said is very shaky. It's very, when you were, when he was this, would you like to read that? Do you want me to read that or is that too much? Uh, I think I'll let you read that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or just give people the link. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Okay. He was the son of our household, from whom my sister and I drew strength and warmth, while our mercurial mother restless orbited newfound widowhood. And uh, I, I love when you said that after like going through many things and uh, the family start partying together and you saying about the family that party together, I stayed together, became our morning after mantra. Yes, true. <laughs> yeah. And the dream that you had, I love that. Yeah. The other night I dreamt that a lead to a box lift and a winged creature emerged Maybe infinity isn't what I imagine. Maybe Chris has become a glorious songbird, flying a rap rhapsode of blue. Yeah. 
Rhapsody of Blue, I also love because they, Woody Allen used that in the beginning of Manhattan. And I think Manhattan, the movie, is such an ode to the city. And I remember when that movie came out thinking, that's my movie. This is my story. That's my story. <laughs> Rhapsody in Blue is, I think, very special to any New Yorker. Oh, yes, because I, I, there are, I read places where you wrote you can take a girl out of New York. Yeah, but not New York and the girl, so. <laughs> so how close is New York still to you? What does it mean, New York, to you now? I love, I mean, I love New York and I love going home and I love my friends and I always feel that a part of my heart is there. You know, I go back and it feels, I feel like it just chimes with such a deep part of my being and you know, some people leave home when they leave home when they're happy not to return to home, but I can never not return to New York. So. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, about Saskia, she had such a journey. Yep. <laughs> like losing the dead also the financial situation changing so much mom trying to work work finding a young a young boyfriend yeah so tell me some tell me a bit more about that um yes um it was a very you know to me it was normal because it was what i knew but i realized it was not a very in retrospect I realized it wasn't a very normal upbringing and I remember you know I always wanted my mother to be more conventional like on parents day I would say just stand in the back of the class and don't wear just wear normal clothes and just act like the other mothers like I was very like you know she was unpredictable <laughs> and I remember um, when she told me that she got a job making pasta. I was at this very waspy summer camp and I went to the library and I cried because I was like, my mother, she's a pasta maker. Like it seems so, <laughs> you know, this is a daughter who is, you know, uh, you know, her grandparents, you know, her forefathers signed the Bill of Rights and here she is working with her hands. And I had a very hard time with that. I think I was a little bit snobby when I was young and I tried to incorporate that into Saskia's character, making her a little bit, yeah, you know, because mm. I, th you know, that that was a part of me, and probably still is to a certain extent. So, yep, anyway, the, in the camp, the scene when she is there waiting for her mom, and then her mom is walking, and she's like, "Everyone here has a car." The team. <laughs> yeah, my mother would bring me lobster. <laughs> <laughs> And she'd bring lobster and white wine to camp. And I'd be like, I, yeah, this is nice, but I'm not really sure this is regulation. <laughs> you know. <sort> of <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and uh, the longing that Saskia had about back to where things were, the togetherness of the family, and I guess with the mom that you should wear Chanel, and you should be so elegant as Grace Kelly. Mm -hmm. And suddenly big changes. Yes, and that, you know, that kind of echoed throughout, you know, the rest of my mother's life. You know, she, you know, was born into money and, and ended up dying, you know, being two years off being penniless. And, you know, she, you know, she had, she had, mental health issues and she has, you know, she had a very complicated personality and, and life didn't turn out the way she thought it would for her. And, you know, so it was something that kind of downward spiral was something that, you know, she would have periods when it was arrested and then periods when, you know, she would decline a bit more. So it was, it was very painful. Mm -hmm. It was very painful. And talking about painful, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Odessa because uh, for Saskia going through all of these and being such a young girl and then to have uh, other people there to support her or 
I think in everyone's life is so important if you have someone that can come and tell you, oh, it's going to be good. So don't worry about this now, but it's... And uh, there is a, something that Odessa says about her mom, which is in page 244. If you could read that, that would be lovely. Yeah, sure. Hold on. Da, 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 because da, da. that for me was like, oh... Um, uh, one second. Oh, grief is a powerful thing. There's no saying which way it will pull you. That's true. And uh, when she goes and you have, and when she says to Saskia, because she's complaining yeah, about her choices of love and man. And how could she go from daddy to him? Saskia tells uh, oh, hold on, Odessa. Uh, and Odessa is uh, the woman that was looking after them. Uh, and then Odessa says, you have to love and respect your mother. She's a good woman who is in a bad way. Well, Odessa was inspired by a woman who worked for us whose name was Ida. And Ida, before she worked for us, worked for George Gershwin during the Depression before he made it big. And George Gershwin wrote a song called Ida, Ida, Sweet as Apple Cider. So I think of that when I think of Ida because she was wonderful. And in real life, Ida did find a junkie in my mother's bed. And, you know, she never left the family, but you know, but I did feel that she was sort of like this voice of normality and she would literally return order, you know, physical order to our house. And she was very observant and she was, she withheld judgment, but she had opinions, but you know, she was remarkably tactful and loving. And when I got older, she would say, Katie, you're getting fat. You got to lose some weight. <laughs> <laughs> would always get on me about like what I was wearing, my hair, my weight, you know. Oh. <laughs> so, now she was special. Oh, Odessa, Ida. Ida, Ida? Yeah. Sweetest apple cider. I mean, it doesn't quite <laughs> rhyme, but you know. <laughs> Odessa. And also then uh, there is a time like for when uh, Saskia forgiving mom, forgiving herself, it's a, uh, that's a, uh, I found that like a very worries that, where did I see that 261? Yeah, that is, I thought was very strong part when she, on page 261. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. This, Oh my God, this scene. I cry, I cry every time I look at this and it didn't happen, but I cry every time. <laughs> you know, it was a sort of reimagining, but it, there's something very, I think this is very, um, it was a very powerful imaginary scenario for me. So, and I think it's about, you know, obviously it's about closure. And, and I think this is the moment, you know, when she begins to sort of stop spinning and to, you know, and to stay put and to deal with what it is that she's been running from. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm like, I highlighted the whole book's highlighted and this is a big one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I could read that paragraph. Saskia, Saskia envisages mom collapsing with grief crazed eyes. If the police had to notify her of her death and her compassion returns, they belong together. She still loves what's left of her mother and has to forgive her for not being able to be it to be, sorry, has to forgive her for not being able to be the person that she once was. She's tried not caring, but she can't give up on that brittle and limited woman or her twisted siblings. Her anger is fierce, but her, but her love for them is as big as the everythingness of every day. Yes, her love for her anger. I love like her anger, but then the love, it's, and it happens so much in families. You have that, ah, uh, but it's, yeah. 
and uh, made me think of another quote from, but this is from Toni Morrison. And uh, if you want to fly, you have to give up the things that weigh you down. So forgiving oneself, forgiving others and all the... And there is a beautiful scene with her and uh, her sister that brought tears in my eyes when they oh, eat in the cafe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, mm, when they meet in the cafe, the gift, page two, 210. So Anna Paul is saying, I love how it, in touch with your emotions you are and it's transpired in the book. All the feeling and images are there. Wow. Thank you, Anna Paula. <laughs> yep. No, I mean, this, this was, um, this was an imaginary, an imagined encounter, but um, I loved finding ways to use an image or an object three times in, in the book. So I have the amethyst ring, which comes up three times. I have the limousine, which comes up three times. I have, um, oh, today's the first day of the rest of my life. You know, she says it three times, but it has three different mm -hmm. meanings every time she says it. So this was a way of using the ring and the sort of awkwardness between the sisters in this scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, so when she gives her the ring, yeah? Because Sa Saskia has this amet amethyst ring that she loves and her sister wants to borrow it sometimes. And she's like, no, it's my, 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 my ring. And then now that she's leaving away, uh, she gives her the ring. And that mm -hmm. scene is very touching. I, I enjoyed writing that. That was fun, that scene. Because that reminds me of things like just the giving of the gift and in that moment that she looks like she's like on chaos is happening around her the coins are falling on the floor and she feels she's being humiliated but that thing it just they stop and there is a connection and uh, for example in my life i remember once i broke uh, i have a relationship that for many years that are uh, uh broke off broke off broke up broke up <laughs> broke up <laughs> And I was so sad and I was just crying and crying and crying. And I remember being in the, going home in the Piccadilly line and sitting on the tube and I couldn't stop crying. I was like, and there was two young black men sitting in front of me. And when they stopped came, they came to me and they handed me their book. It was a thin book and was a poetry book, which they wrote. And in that moment, I was, I was like, what? And for them, I guess, was very vulnerable to go to someone who is in tears and says, you okay, is everything fine? And uh, they gave me the book and that in a way it just, it just did something to me, like, like someone coming and saying, I can see you, I can feel you, you are not alone, we are all connected. So it's that, reading that, it brought me memories for all mm -hmm. things like that that happened to me. Another one was when I was in Victoria uh, stay, uh, tube station, I was sitting there and then a tall, uh, strong black man came in and sat in front of me and I looked at him and he was so sad. He was just so sad that when I was leaving, I used to have uh, to wear a, a bracelet that was the chakra bracelet, which I love with stones, the chakras, stones. And I, oh! <laughs> and I gave to so many friends. And this one has been in my arm for like two years. And I'm there. And, and when my station arrived, the time for me to get out, I just went there, took my bracelet and went, grabbed his hand and putting his hand. He hold it 
and that time we did eye contact he smiled and I smiled and for me like when I read that that is there is this connection that between us the magic of human beings that it's like it goes beyond other things so I, I completely... love that and then I, I love have... when in, in the envelope sorry no, I, also, I mean, I think people in cities, you know, people always say, oh, New York and, you know, London are such cruel cities. And I'm like, really? You know, because I think if you, if you, if you're sort of empathetic, you know, you, you can be nice to people and they can be nice to you when you least expect it. And, and there are moments of generosity and, and tenderness, you know, in these thriving capitals. So I agree with you. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, for, you that are listening to our conversation, if you have any moments like that that happened, we would love to hear it. You can send it via message to Kate and I uh, in the message private because we love stories and uh, beautiful stories like that. It's precious. <sighs> Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Oh, so. Dave is being optioned for TV, so we are going to wait for that to see what's... If COVID hasn't completely blown that out of the water, but, you know, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. If one needs the uh, way I look at it. <laughs> so... Yes. On Amazon, Barnes & Noble, on Kindle. So uh, you can hard... buy on Amazon, Kindle. Hard copy. I mean, sorry, Barnes & Noble... Um, Waterstones have it I think they order it for you so it's easy to get and if you have any questions feel free to drop me a line lovely and what's next are you writing anything that oh I'm working on a short story because I've decided I want to write short stories that are set in New York from different points of view from my life because everyone said to me oh you have to write a sequel to Happy as Larry and I was like yeah, don't know if I want to do that. Um, and also, I feel like I feel like the sort of time frame was less definitive, and so I think I want to just take aspects of that of you know moments in my life and write it right around it. So I'm working on a short story that has kind of fallen by the wayside because of COVID, my brother, Christmas, work. But I'm going to pick it up again and try to finish that in the next month. So. Oh, and where can we see that? Well, whatever I publish, I will post on Instagram. Okay. So okay. just follow Happy is Larry NYC and you'll be the first to know. And uh, one question that I always ask is, if you had a superpower, what would that be? <gasps> superpower. Wow, that is a really good question. Um, man, Carol, you caught me off guard. Um, what would my superpower be? A, a long and healthy life. <laughs> a long and healthy life? Yeah. Oh, that's a good superpower. <laughs> Very good. And more... And um, a clearer thinking, you know, like just, I feel like my mind gets so cluttered sometimes with responsibilities and work. I would just love the ability just to kind of zone everything out and get back into, you know, the writing head a lot faster than it, than I do sometimes. Okay. Super and talking about superpowers in the last conversation I had, someone then asked, what about if you could go back in time were where which where in time would you go i would love to be a, i would love to have been like a flapper or i would love what is to, a flapper like 1920s you know like a you know prohibition time like the period that s scott fitzgerald wrote about a lot oh yeah like gin speakeasies i think i could i could see myself in a speakeasy no problem so that would have been good or uh, yeah, I think that's the first one that comes to mind. 1920s. 1920s. Okay. Yeah. And I would have loved to have seen America before it became ruined. I would love to have traveled, you know, west and turned the century. That would have been amazing. 
Mm. <laughs> and Keita, thank you so much. And uh, I thank want to say a quote was in the end that based on all these things we've been talking, again, by Toni Morrison, there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That's how civilizations heal. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Carol. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Keita. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, if and if you guys have any questions, please send us messages. Thank you for being here and joining.